So 10 years ago, I started working on orphan genetic diseases. And I'm a computer scientist, so this is not really an obvious choice. And I would always get the same reaction. Well, yeah, maybe you can find the cause of those diseases, but developing drugs for those diseases is way too expensive. So anyway, you can't do anything for your patients. And I guess this should have discouraged me and should have sent me somewhere else to try and work on something different. And instead, I think it appealed to a side of me that's a bit of an advocate of desperate causes. So I thought, well, if nobody really cares about those diseases, I'll do it. Now, rare genetic diseases, they're rare. So one in 20,000, 100 patients, you know, 25 patients in Belgium, like the case of uh, Victor that was recently in the press here in, in Belgium for a very expensive treatment that cost almost half a million uh, dollars per year. But there is over 7,000 uh, identified uh, genetic disorders. And together, they make up about 5% of the population. So these diseases are very expensive. We're talking about people who often need lifelong support, very e expensive supportive treatments. And so really, all together, multiply the number of patients in total over the total cost of those diseases that are over several decades sometimes, and you get something that actually come close in burden to society uh, to that of, of uh, cardiovascular disease or cancer. Uh, many of these people, you never see them, but they actually are in institutions, uh, um, and it's, it's very hard to, to take good care of them. And that, that can hit everybody. Actually, most of you will know a friend, a family, colleagues, um, who has a child with a, a major birth uh, disorder. And by now, I guess most of you have recognized Colin Farrell. And Colin Farrell has, has a son, he has two sons. One of them, James, suffers from Angelman syndrome. And that's a disease that um, uh, uh, hits about 1 in 20,000 uh, kids. Um, it's a neurodegenerative motor disease um, linked to intellectual disability. And basically, it took two years for uh, doctors to get a correct diagnosis. Um, and it took four years for James to uh, learn to walk. And so this is a citation from, from Colin Farrell when his uh, son first uh, took his first steps. So really, this is something that's, that's all across uh, uh, society and uh, uh, that we want to address forcefully. Now, in the past, it's been really quite hard, and 40% of the patients still now never get a diagnose. And those who get a diagnose often wait five to seven years to get that diagnose. Now, there is a total game changer, and that's sequencing. It's been mentioned several times, so I'll, I'll give some details about that in a, in a second. And what we need there, that's the first uh, argument, we need a big data revolution. Data on a massive scale, very di uh, difficult to analyze. So this is part of the, the BRCA1 uh, gene sequence. Uh, a single mutation in that, in that gene can cause uh, breast uh, cancer. So if you're not colorblind, which by the way is a genetic disorder, uh, you'll be able to see the mutated G out of this part of the sequence of, of BRCA1. Basically, we have 23 chromosome pairs, in total 3 billion base pairs of DNA, and between two individuals, we'll have a few million differences. Several of those can be risk factors, a couple tens or a couple hundreds can be risk factors for diseases, uh, but sometimes just one is enough to cause the disease. So we have to find that one in three million change that causes a disease. That's extremely challenging. So, what is the, the fundamental transition that is happening, and we're right in the middle of it, and that's genome sequencing. And it's been mentioned for the microbiome, for other things, this is really changing life science completely. So in 2000, the human genome was, was um, completed. We got one genome, and that cost uh, $3 billion and took about 13 years. Um, in 2007, the genome of Watson, the um, discoverer of the double helix structure, was a, a sequence for one million, and that took one month. Today, you can get a genome sequence for about $3,000, and it would take about a week. Tomorrow, we'll have what we call the $1,000 genome, sequencing a day, meaning that 
for many, many things when you arrive at the hospital and we don't know quite what's happening, we will just sequence your genome. That means also that we'll produce massive amount of data because I'll show you here what it does to uh, uh, rare genetic diseases, but this applies just as well in, in cancer, where actually cancer is becoming a large family of rare genetic diseases because each patient is being treated individually, personally, um, or in preventive uh, uh, medicine, where we actually try to give you uh, longer years of good health by knowing your risk profile and try to adapt treatments to that. So if you sequence a genome, what can you do now that was very hard to do before, or, or not if not impossible? This is a case of, of a patient seen in, in Leuven. So you sequence the genome actually in practice in the clinic, because this technology is in the clinic now. Um, in the clinic, you sequence the 3% of the genome that's most informative, that codes for genes. And you have 3 million differences, while well, you actually limit ourselves to about 10,000. And then we start asking, well, what properties should a difference, should a mutation have to be relevant? And we can cut this uh, list down to about seven mutations. And then we say, well, it's maybe one of those mutations. Maybe it's somewhere else. So we're stuck. So how do we solve that problem? Well, geneticists rely on actually identifying another patient. This is a patient uh, seen in the Netherlands by a colleague from my colleague in Leuven. Um, and this patient actually also has a genome analysis done. And there, there are six uh, mutations identified. And there's actually one mutation that's exactly identical. It's like the G from the previous slide. One single identical change between those two uh, patients explains the intellectual disability and the special features. These kids are not related. They're absolutely they're not nephew, uh, um, cousins or anything like that. They're totally unrelated. What you see, what you perceive, are slight anomalies, like the position of the ears or the thinness of the lips, the shape of the, uh, the nose, that are very characteristic of the specific effect of that one uh, mutation. Now, how is this done in practice? In practice, my colleague Kuhn de Vrindt went to a large uh, a conference, and he got five minutes' time to actually present this patient to an audience about as big as this one. And then another colleague said, actually, I, I have a patient like that. Let's have a look at it. Now, this is interesting, but we have this genome sequencing. We are sequencing genome after genome after genome. We actually have a huge problem with data. This is not scalable. You know, looking at, at pictures together will not solve that problem. In 2000, we had one genome. Today, we have sequenced maybe, we're, we cannot keep track of it uh, anymore already, maybe 100,000 genomes. A conservative estimate would be that in 2020, we'll have 20 million genomes. Okay? 20 million genomes, one genome is 3 billion base pairs. It's, it's about 10 large encyclopedias for those who are old enough to have seen encyclopedia before. Um, it can be encoded in one, one CD, it's only 3 billion characters, um, but the data we produce, that's about one terabyte, that's about one hard drive. Okay? So, in 2020, we'll have 20 million hard drives. I had a hard time depicting how big that could be. Fortunately, Miko helped me. He actually said, look at this data center of NSA, and that will bring us to my next point. This data center of NSA is actually about half the size to 20% the size of all the genomes that we will have sequenced by that. We're talking the NSA people, they're serious about their business. We're talking about a lot of data. So what we need is we need a worldwide infrastructure to share or get access to this data because we cannot solve these cases without access to the data. I need to get access to data of a patient from uh, uh, Canada or from Japan or from Chile to actually be able to make those matches. We need to have access, maybe not 200%, but a large percentage of these genomes, we need to network them. Now, I don't want the NSA to snoop on my genome. I don't want the NSA to snoop on your genome. Um, so what we need is we need a new social contract. You know, here in Europe, we, we do worry about privacy. Okay? And this is a real problem. I think Miko made a fantastic point around that. But we need this information. Okay? This is the first point. The second point is this genomic data is not, um, it's, it's not nothing. It's important. And, and it's, in particular, it's never anonymous. 
So if I sequence the genome of somebody, there is a good chance I can identify who this person is. So this is a male, XY. Uh, we're living in California and bo born in 1946. And we sequenced the genome, or my colleagues somewhere in the world sequenced the genome. I didn't do that myself, sorry, um, for, for claiming that. And actually, if you look at that and you think, well, can you discover who the person is from the genome? Nah, actually, you can. The Y chromosome in males comes from his father, his father's father, his father's father's father. It's your family name. And so there's some little spots on the Y chromosome that genealogists actually sequence to actually make family trees. And there are big databases uh, uh, in the world with all these identity markers on chromosome Y. So when you go with that sequence of chromosome Y in one of the database, you know that the guy is called Venter. Now you know that the guy lives in California, that he was born in 1946, because that's a patient in a study. And there are two, two Venters in California that fulfills those requirements. Now, maybe this is a study about schizophrenia. Well, I'm sure Craig Venter, if he was a patient in a genome sequencing project linked to schizophrenia, would not want people to know he is that patient. So for most of us, that's maybe not a big deal, but actually for celebrities, CEOs, that would be a big issue. And there will be other attacks. I mean, when we start looking at that, we'll find more and more things. So we have this tension, and I don't want to deny the tension because the tension is very real. On the one hand, I am demanding for the whole genetics society, I'm demanding access to this data, control access. I don't want just to get all the data on the street. On the other hand, society demands some privacy. So society also demands the best medical care. There is no difference between medicine and research in this field and in many other fields. The difference has become very small. You cannot say there is research on one side, medicine on the other side. Finding this mutation and helping these patients was exactly the same process. So we want access to the data. We actually want more. We want to actually be able to use the data fairly freely. Uh, so I have a broad consent. And what you are able to return is we want to uh, uh, manage the data transparently, so provide IT infrastructure so that you know whose data has been seen by whom. We want ICT researchers who are not physicians to fulfill the ontology codes. I need to be held, although I'm a computer scientist and not a geneticist, to the same requirements that the physician needs to uh, fulfill. So I recognize the tension, and I want you to think about what you want. In the end, society will decide, especially Europe will decide. We are facing a very big threat from the European uh, uh, data privacy regulation, which is we don't know where it's going. On the one hand, it could go to giving us that access that we request. On the other hand, other versions of that new regulation just block everything. I've tried to argue that this would be a big mistake. So I want you to reflect on what do you want to do with this data? Uh, what do you want out of it? How do you want society to handle it and help us actually build the infrastructures? I'm sure there are many people in the audience that can do that. Help us build the infrastructure to help all these patients. Because in the end, it's about patients who have severe diseases and who need help. Thank you very much.